My name is William Pink. I'm a member of the Agua Caliente tribe of Capeno Indians. We're originally from Warner Springs area and we're relocated in 1903 to the Paula Valley. And so today I'm going to be demonstrating about textile uses of Southern California Indians. Uh, all of the tribes engaged in making cordage and other products that come from plants and so we're going to be talking about some of the plant uses. The main one for cordage, the strongest cordage, is called dogbane. And these grow in long stalks, then the material is collected and then spun into cordage. And so I'm going to do a demonstration of how that is done. There's a couple ways of actually getting the fiber out. One is simple like this where you just peel the bark off. And then once you, there's also within the stock is fine cordage or fine fibers that can be spun into thread. And this can be used for thread as well. So uh, you can see the, the fiber coming off of the stock itself. After the fiber is harvested from the stock, uh, there's no more use for the stock actually except for maybe little sticks. Another way of recovering the fiber is that you blister the outer bark taking a knife and not using the sharp side but by blistering it you get rid of all of that bark that's going to interfere with the quality of the uh, cordage that you're using. This takes a lot more work. but. If you're going to be making like an eagle skirt or other things and then you want your highest quality fiber to come out of this then by removing that bark you can again come in and pull away that cordage or that material so and this is actually stronger because you're not incorporating the bark into the to the spin itself so once you've gathered your dog bane and you've then create your work skeins that you can work from for, for spinning cordage. And the one thing about dog bane is it's extremely poisonous. So I'm going to be working with the material that I pulled off and I'll probably pull some more. Uh, you want to avoid putting it in your mouth. I, which is a bad habit I have of doing all the time. And so I can break up that bark a little bit before I start spinning. And I always ask the kids about, you know, famous spinners in here and hardly anybody knows the answers. Occasionally somebody will and, you know, the what was the name of the girl that used to spin the gold into straw and rumple stilk skin and it's a tricky answer because the answer is that she didn't have a name. She was only known as the Miller's daughter. So this is now, I can start spinning this. And I wet my finger just a little bit, which helps maintain the friction on it. Not getting anywhere. If I can get it down. So usually would spin it around a stick or something. I use a fishing reel now to make long line. It works pretty well. And you can't do this too long. You cut the circulation off in the end of your finger. So you have to be careful not to do that.
normally I would stick my finger in my mouth to wet my finger, but one time my stung, tongue started feeling kind of strange, so I quit doing that. We had another student who actually chewed on some and had to go to the hospital. So, and this plant is becoming, I won't call it rare, but very difficult to find because the United States government set out on a program to poison all of the dog bane because it was killing cattle. So to my knowledge in Riverside County, there's only nine colonies left of this particular plant where it could be used for uh, making cordage or gather, gathering enough material for making cordage. What happens is then you have this spun area and, and there's all this tension on the string and so it's going to spin back on itself. So you go from string to cordage. The cordage is a twist and this stuff is pretty durable and usually I would give you guys a chance pass it around, $20 to anybody that could break the cordage. And we used to have a lot of cheaters. One, one, one student tried to bite through it, another one cut it with his fingernail, that didn't count. But so far, nobody's been able to pull it and break it, but that's an idea of how strong this is used. So what is a string used for? <coughs> so we make different sizes of cordage, and then it has different uses. Uh, bow string is one. On this particular one, this is a mixture of fiber and, and deer sinew to make a strong string, but also the deer sinew, which is the material on the back of this bow. This bow was made by Tony Soros, and uh, the deer sinew itself could be spun into cordage and makes extremely strong cordage. The only problem is susceptible to moisture. So, um, but anyway, again, plants using arrowweed for the arrows. These are target arrows, so Tony actually fixed metal tips onto it. Uh, this is a very strong bow. I can't even string it without some help, so I'm not even going to try. Uh, but it's probably about a 50-pound pull on this small bow because of the sinew that's placed on the back. Get it measured one of these days. So the other thing is carrying nets. And this is an example of a carrying net. It's not a fishing net, but these were used to carry ollas and other materials in here. Uh, firewood. This only has the one side to it, so I'm not going to be able to use it. But the way the people here would carry that would be on their back. There would be a strap that would hook it here, then the net would be on their backside. So they'd carry it kind of like a backpack, but the, the main strap would be on the forehead to hold the net up. So, let's see if this one has both cords. It does. So this one would be tied to a headpiece here, and then this would actually hang towards the back, like this. And then this is how they would carry their materials around. And this is all made with dogbane cordage here. But dogbane wasn't the only source of cordage. Uh, yucca fiber is very important. The yucca plant's very important. So the fiber is claimed from the leaves to make this fine, almost like a horsehair fiber. And these were made into skirts for the women. This is only a section of a skirt here. It's not finished yet. But at the same time then, this material here from the yucca can be spun into cordage and, and nets can be made from this as well. So this is a yucca fiber net and used for carrying. These weren't used for fishing, although they, they could make fishing nets as well. But it works very well for holding ollas off the ground or being able to carry uh, clay pots. And then also these were used for the babies. They would use a softer, different material and make the nets and make like a small hammock and that's where the babies would sleep where the mother could carry them in front of them with, the, with it around their neck. So these were used for, for the babies as well. A couple more. 
I'm going to move these out of the way. So the yucca plant is very important and had a lot of different uses. From the leaves, we get the fiber. From the stalk, which is the dried stalk, uh, we're able to eat the stalk. And then also the fruit from the uh, yucca plant. And then this was used to carry the arrows. This is an arrow quiver. So just by hollowing it out and attaching, again, a yucca fiber uh, strap onto it to where you could actually carry it, you know, with your bow and stuff. So, and then for arrows, there's a lot of different types of wood that was used for the arrows. This one is arrow cane, which comes from the Owens Valley area, all the way down into Anza Borrego State Park. You can recover this kind of cane for making very lightweight arrows. The hard knock on these is a chemise wood, and they would make a hard point uh, to go in the front of the arrow, and also used for the, uh, the games. So with these then, they could be stored or carried around in, in the uh, quiver itself. Okay, then another use for the cordage was for games. This was a game and um, several different games and uh, Blossom Hathaway, she does a string game and I've been able to make her various uh, strings for her, which is a continuous loop uh, that she's able to do the cat's cradle game and make different designs. And I think you'll be able to see her show on this as well and what's done. And so the idea of this game is to catch as many of the rings as you can. So I'm going to give it a try. I'm a little bit high for it. I got one, so that's one point. <coughs> so some people are able to catch them all in one time. It takes a lot of practice. Another way to do the game is my great aunt used to be able to do this, and she'd always make fun of us, saying the boys couldn't do anything right. But the way she would do it is she would line these up so that they were every other one, like that. And then she would settle it down, pull it out so that there'd be one every other side, then she would throw it up, and she would only catch every other one. And she could do it almost every time. So it uh, can be a very difficult game and a lot different than the computer games today. It was used for uh, development of hand-eye uh, hand coordination. So if, and you can see that I caught all but one of them that time. So after a little bit of practice, uh, you should be able to become good at the game. But again, we had to use cordage for that that came from the dog bane. Other plants, ironwood, which grows out in the desert, used for making rabbit sticks because it's a nice hardwood. These were for hunt hunting rabbits, so bow wasn't always used. But they also used snares made from the cordage uh, to trap rabbits. So snare was very simple. It was just simply a noose, and they would put it around the rabbit run. And when the rabbit would go through their run, they would get caught on the snare and then they would come get their rabbit for dinner. So these would work. They'd be anchored to a stick in the ground or something, but this would be spread. And so when the rabbit went through that, then, then the cord would tighten on them and then the rabbit would be caught. So again, another important reason for the cordage and having strong cordage. But in addition to the snares, then, were the rabbit sticks. And these were designed so that when you threw them, they would skim across the ground like a helicopter blade. Or you could throw them straight down on them. And so because of the weight, they would deliver quite a blow. And you'd have rabbit that night. So another thing I wanted to show today was the use of the pump drill. These were used for drilling holes in beads and, and other materials shell beads. It's 
It's a very simple tool. There's a question about its origin, but it was used. And the idea is without electricity to be able to spin this, to be able to drill holes through wood and different things. So, and I have a lot of trouble with people who don't want to come back up. When they get down the bottom, they stop and wonder why it's not working anymore. And then they're looking for the cord for the plug. It doesn't exist, it's all within themselves. They have to take their time and be able to get it spinning. So then this will actually drill a hole into the wood or through a shell bead so that I could string the bead onto a necklace. And this looks like an ordinary stone, but it's not. This is called soapstone. And beads were often made with this as well. And this drill could actually go fairly quickly through the soapstone. Soapstone was brought in from Catalina Island. There's places in the Angeles National Forest where there's soapstone quarries. But you can see it's actually drilling a hole fairly easily in this. And the reason being is soapstone is softer than your fingernail. I can scratch this with my fingernail. But so a fingernail is considered a one hardness, whereas soapstone's a 0.7. So I can actually carve it with a knife. And from this, then I make arrow straighteners, pipes and other utensils, cooking utensils and stuff that I would be using. So, but by putting a groove in this, and then I could run my arrow shaft through it to straighten it out. I would wet the arrow shaft, heat the stone up, and then I would run the arrow shaft back and forth. And once it heated up, got soft, then I could bend it to where it was straight. And so that was used for straightening the arrow shafts. So soapstone's an important one, but again, it's, it's very soft. And you can drill into it easier than the wood actually so okay and one thing when working with soapstone don't blow on it just wipe it away or rinse it off with water when you blow it it goes into the air and you get dust all over everything but again just an example of how soft this material is well that's uh, what I'll be able to show you today about Southern California Indians, and I hope you're able to learn something. Uh, number one is that we're still here, we have not disappeared, and many of us still use these materials today. So I enjoyed sharing with you, and I hope you learned something, and uh, next time we see each other, we're all together in the classroom again. Thank you very much.